And it, it does change sort of your mindset. Uh, you tend to live more in the moment than worrying about the future as much. This episode is brought to you by Portfolio Box, an online portfolio made by creatives for creatives. Body sore, uh, whatever the case may be, I can't get to this particular thing, right? To me, being mentally tough means you can take your mind someplace else and concentrate on that other thing to the point where the thing that was bothering you is no longer a focus and you don't feel it anymore. Hey, what's up, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Hardwood Rod Podcast. We're back here, and today I'm joined by three-time travel photographer of the year. Gary Arndt joins the podcast today as we're going to touch a little bit on him selling his home where he could travel full time. So for the past 13 years, he's traveled all over the world, seven continents, 200 countries and territories. We're going to touch a little bit on his podcast. So stay tuned for this exciting journey around the world. Welcome back to another podcast. It's a busy week and I'm just, uh, I'm glad to have this world-class photographer join the podcast today. You know, he's a three-time travel photographer of the year. He's been to over 140 countries, pretty much worldwide. Gary Art, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. I'm just excited because uh, I'm a filmmaker, but I would like to consider myself a photographer so i'm excited just to pick your brain a little bit and you know see what you're up to you know and where are you currently right now uh right now i'm in wisconsin and that's okay where I live. oh okay so i guess uh this whole pandemic got you kind of uh i would say just kicking back at home yeah i haven't traveled at all really since i was in a trip to portugal in february and i got back home in march and i haven't really been anywhere since Wow. So I bet you're probably itching just to get, you know, out there. Actually, I'm keeping myself really busy now. I launched a new podcast in July and it's a daily podcast. So that's where I'm spending most of my time now. Wow. And uh, you did mention that, you know, you've been doing 100 podcasts, uh, guest and uh, hosting, right? Uh, yeah, over the last several years. I have a travel podcast that I've been doing since 2009 and we've done... I think we're close to 275 shows, plus many, many, many appearances on other people's podcasts. Awesome, awesome. So what, give us a little bit of background, you know, uh, who you are and, you know, what, what, what has brought you to this world of, you know, traveling the world and just, you know, taking pictures? Uh, It was back in 2007, I sold my home and I thought I was going to travel around the world for the year. And that one year kind of ended up becoming 14 years. Uh, I spent nine of those years without a house, uh, without a home. I just traveled around the world nonstop. Wow. <clears throat> Eventually got a place, but I would still spend a third to a half of the year on the road, which has been what I've been doing for the last four or five years up until the pandemic. And this is kind of the longest I've been in in one spot for any one time. Wow. And how how is that lifestyle like as far as, you know, not having a home, but just living remotely? Because that's that seems to be a, like there's a lot of people that uh, that, you know what, I'm just going to travel the world and wherever, wherever I'll, I'll, I'll stay, I'll stay. And wherever I end up, it's kind of like just living, living their life, sort of say. Right. So how how is that lifestyle? You get used to it. I remember when I first started, I was somewhere in Hawaii. And normally when you go on a trip, in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, well, eventually I'll go home, whether it's a good trip or a bad trip. And Mm -hmm. it dawned on me that I wasn't going home. This was it. You know, I had no place else to go. And it was one of those things that you sort of had to, I don't know, you you just have to mentally sort of accept the fact that this is reality. And it it does change sort of your mindset. Uh, You tend to live more in the moment than worrying about the future as much. That's kind of a one of those things that we take for granted sometimes, right? Where you know you're 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 living your day day by day, and if you know you're working every day, right, you kind of don't get to enjoy those moments. And I think 
with this whole kind of pandemic since it began early on, I mean, at least for me, where I kind of feel where things have slowed down for me, right? I'm working remotely. Uh, you know, I'm enjoying my family time. So you get to enjoy those those small things, right? Um, so with with traveling the world, how how has your your perception of the world changed for you? Uh, it hasn't really changed that much. It's more just a matter of my personal life having to refocus some other things as opposed to what I may have done before. Okay. You know, because I'm not traveling, I have to focus on other things. A lot of my uh, business basically just disappeared with the pandemic because I was so reliant on the travel industry. People weren't buying trips anymore. And then on the other end of things in the travel industry, they weren't buying marketing or advertising anymore. So it really hurt my business. And I had to make a pretty big pivot. And that's why I kind of started doing a new podcast because I really didn't have any other options. So my podcast isn't a travel podcast per se. It's more of a history podcast, but with one foot firmly planted in the travel world and that I get to talk about things people, places, and things that I may have encountered or experienced during my travels. Yeah. And that's a good, uh, you know, having all that experience, right. You know, you're doing, like you said, like a history kind of podcast theme, but you have those experiences from different types of cultures, you know, like, you know, you you travel to, for for example, Asia, right. You know, you talk about the history of, uh, you know, the, the Chinese empire or something like that. Right. But you have that, those, that, those uh, experiences and those monuments that you've been to um, talk about a little bit about your podcast. Um, how has, how many, how many uh, years have you been doing your podcast? I just started it in July and okay. I'm doing show number 120 today. Uh, so it's oh, a daily wow. show. Yeah. There's no interviews. It's just a scripted show. So every day I have to write a script somewhere between, uh, usually 1,200 and 2,500 words every day. So the, the shows are about 7 to 12 minutes in length. And it's on a completely different topic every day. Uh, I've done shows on why sliced bread is the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> With the history of ketchup. The history, you know, the, on explaining the electoral college. Uh, the episode I'm working on that I'll be working on as soon as I'm done talking to you is who is the richest person in history? And trying to answer that question, which is actually not an easy question to answer, because when you go back in time, Mm -hmm, talking about wealth becomes a very different thing, because the reality is, especially when you look at material things, people are just way richer today, even average people, than even kings would have been a couple hundred years ago. And I don't think many people would trade a modern life with modern conveniences to being a king 300 years ago. Yeah, maybe you had a gigantic palace, but it was a palace that was cold and drafty and without internet or you couldn't fly anywhere. And, uh, you know, the medical system was horrible and the food wasn't great. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's kind of those things, right? Where, I mean, if how, how would you identify that, right? I'm pretty sure you kind of have it kind of laid out, but give us a little kind of little teaser of, uh, of who for the modern time as far as who do you think would be classified as maybe possibly potentially the richest man or woman in the, you know, in the world? Well, that's just it. It depends how you define it. So like today it's Jeff Bezos, right? Yeah. Because he owns a bunch of Amazon, but let's say you go back in time, 120, 140 years. So you have someone like John Rockefeller. He sold his business, I think, at one point for like $450 million, which is a lot of money. Yeah. But so you can inflation adjust that, in which case it's only a couple billion dollars. So he'd still be rich, but not the richest person compared to people today. But if you compare it to a percentage of the entire economy, it was much larger than what Bezos is today. So that depends on how you want to look at it. The economy as a whole was much smaller. So is having a larger percentage of the economy mean you're richer? You know, compared to everyone else, compared to other people in the population, yes. But in comparison to what someone might be worth today, maybe no. That's why I'm saying it's not an easy question. 
And then you yeah, get into people who are like kings or emperors, where they basically controlled everything from a whole country. How do you evaluate that person's wealth? So that's kind of the stuff I'll be talking about. It, it's really not that easy of a question as you might think it is. No, it's 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 kind of one of those kind of like makes you think about it. So I'll be for sure be tuning into that to that episode. Uh, that's a pretty interesting topic right there. You know, because you think about you know like the the lifestyle and stuff like that, but. That's an interesting topic there. So if you guys haven't tuned into your podcast, uh, we'll be you know, making sure to tune in. And what's the name of your podcast again? Uh, Everything, Everywhere, Daily. Perfect. Perfect. That's an easy one to remember. <laughs> yeah. Just you know, short shows every day that you can just learn something new. Yeah. I think that's what a lot of people like too is you know, something where they get value quick and you know, move on to the next. So Gary, tell us a little bit about your big kind of title, I guess, right? Three-time travel photographer of the year. Like, how, first, you know, first question is, you know, how how do you obtain that, right? Like, uh, if there's somebody out there, how would you become a travel photographer of the year? And second, are are you aiming to become the four-time travel photographer of the year? Uh, so there's two different organizations that have given me that title. One is the Society of American Travel Writers, and the other is the North American Travel Journalists Association. I won the North American Travel Journalists Association Award twice and the Society of American Travelers uh, once. And basically, you just submit. They have an awards competition every year, and you submit a portfolio of images, and they have judges that judge it on a blind basis. And uh, that's how you that's how you win. And beyond that, it's just, you know, being a good photographer, having a great portfolio of images taken from around the world. And that's kind of how you do it. Hey, are you a photographer, designer, artist, architect, model, musician or even a makeup artist? You got to check out Portfolio Box. With Portfolio Box, you're not forced to use any standard theme. You can use any style for any page and create a truly unique website that reflects you and your work. If you're a creative, it's a no-brainer. Get 50% off for 12 months on all plans with promo code ROD50. That's promo code ROD50. And check out PortfolioBox.net today. Now, being being in the game for, for years, I, I, I assume... How, how do you like, how do you see now everything changing, right? As far as you mentioned portfolio, right? So how, I know it has changed, but for you personally, when they ask you portfolio, what's the first thing you're thinking now as far as when somebody wants to see your portfolio, do you direct them to a website or do you just show them your IG feed? Uh, no. So if someone, if I just wanted to meet someone and they wanted to see a portfolio of my work, I have a website. So I have like a smug mug website and I just have a page that has like a mm-hmm. hundred of my top photos and I'll send them there. For an awards competition, there's usually a time limit on it. So you might okay. be looking at, usually it's like the last year or the last two years where the image had to have been taken. And so when I'm editing my photos, I'm always kind of thinking in the back of my mind, is this something I could possibly submit for an award? And then I keep a list of those, or I keep like a gallery on Smug Mug. And then when it comes time to actually submit the award, so maybe I'll have 50 images or something, and then I just need to bring that down to 20 or whatever the number is for the portfolio. And a lot of times you're second guessing yourself, you're trying to think, well, what might someone want? Uh, you want to have a diverse mix of different types of images. So you want some of people, you want some of landscapes, different things like that. And that's kind of what you try to do. What would you call yourself, like, as far as type of photographer, uh, you know, would you be like, you know, nature, landscape? What what would be your kind of, uh, your ideal kind of, this is the type of photography I do? Uh, travel photographer. Travel? Uh, travel just, kind of just, encompasses all of that. Yeah. You know, I've done wildlife. I've done landscape. I've done people. Uh, that's all kind of under the, the broad category of travel photography. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, as I'm scrolling through your feed, you know, you, you, you have a you know diverse range of types of photos, you know, from people to, to wildlife, you know. 
and there's couple there's two that kind of stand out and they're they're both pretty amazing um but you know you got you got one that was shot i believe like in canada in the arctic you know of these polar bears and then you got another one like in ethiopia with this camel and we're just it looks like you're in like in the middle of a sandstorm now take us take us back a little bit to uh to that shot in canada where you're like in the arctic how, how is that like as far as uh you know you're dealing with the as far as the cold the weather all that like uh, how, what what goes into getting those shots in that type of environment uh so when you're doing wildlife you first have to figure out where the animals are right mm-hmm. i mean th- that just doesn't happen by chance so yeah. in that case i went up to churchill manitoba which is probably the number one place in the world to go photograph polar bears. The particular location, polar bears hang out there waiting for the sea ice to freeze so they can go out and hunt seals. And the year I happened to have been there was a very good year because the sea ice was late, which meant that there were a lot of polar bears hanging around. So I think one day we saw like 43 polar bear, just one day. And to give you an idea, the next year, it, the sea ice froze early and the people that went out on the same trip I did saw zero. <laughs> so it, it's hit or miss. And you're in these big things called tundra buggies, which I, I kind of describe as a cross between a school bus and a monster truck. They're enormous tundra wheels, buggies. six foot high wheels, and the polar bears can't get you from up there. And it can go over the frozen tundra real easy. And that's basically your, your platform for shooting. And you dress really warm. And, you know, when you're, when you're photographing, you're probably going to have the windows open on the tundra buggy. So it's going to get cold and, uh, you, you just kind of have to prepare for it. And for like the, the camels, um, I'm not sure exactly which one you're looking at, but is it a camel by itself? Uh, but yes, it's a camel by itself. You could, okay, that, you could, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. That was taken during a sandstorm. So that was taken in the, uh, Danakil depression in Ethiopia And it was literally, the temperature was like 50 degrees Celsius. So it was like 120 something. It's one of the hottest, lowest places on earth. Yeah. And I actually shot that out of a car window, which I almost never, ever, ever do because you get reflection and glare and it's not, you know, ideal. You almost never want to shoot through glass. But in that case, it was was so hot. Yeah, it was so hot and uh, there was this, you know, you get sandblasted if you roll down the window that I just shot it through the window and it worked fine. Yeah, it kind of, I mean, you would you can't even tell. I mean, but, but you, you got a sandstorm in the middle of it. So, I mean, <laughs> that's just that's just insane, you know, and I got to ask you, what what are you using? Like, what's your what's your go to camera? Uh, now I have a Sony a7R II. Uh-oh. And you've you joined the, the dark side of there. <laughs> well, you know, I shot Nikon for years and I was waiting for them to upgrade their camera models. And they never did because I had an A300, uh, a D300S. And I waited for years for them to upgrade their cameras. And eventually I got to a point where I was going to, I made the decision to go to Sony because I had a lot of friends that were having really good results on Sony Um, and I would also have to shift to a full frame camera as opposed to a crop sensor one that I was using. So I made the switch and I do not regret it in the slightest. Uh, the low level or the low light capabilities on the a seven R two is great. And, you know, and that, and they have a new generation of cameras that have come out since then. And low light really means a lot for me when shooting, because I'm often in places like a church or a temple or something, and I Mm -hmm. can't use a flash. So I have to use ambient light, whatever that is. And being able to shoot in low light conditions is, I think, really important for travel photography because you don't have control over your surroundings. So you need to adapt to it as much as possible. So, yeah, I've been pretty happy. And my primary lens is a uh, 24 to 240 millimeter super zoom. Um, I can put that on that one lens and it'll cover most situations. I'll occasionally, I have a, a wide angle lens that I also carry with me and like a 50 millimeter fixed lens that I'll use occasionally. And if I know I'm going to be shooting wildlife, I have like a 600 meter, millimeter lens, but I don't use that that often. Okay. So that's kind of like your go-to, your, your go-to kit. Yeah. And, and you know, you don't carry a whole lot of gear. 
Uh, I don't think travel photography really lends itself to that. So it's not like you have this bag full of lenses and you pick the perfect lens based on what you're doing. Uh, you don't want to miss a shot. And so having one lens that's kind of adaptable to anything is kind of more important to me than having a perfect lens. Yeah, I mean, personally for me, I mean, I like to travel light, you know, but I'm more of a video shooter. But even then, I like to go handheld just because, you know, it's just I want to once I get to the scene or on set, I just I just want to start, you know, boom, let's let's start recording. So that's that's for me. But yeah, there's a lot of people that, you know, that's the trend is Sony. Like people, you know, 10 years ago, it was Canon. Right. And I feel like now everybody and their cousin is just now has has a Sony camera. So um, interesting, interesting that you know you know we have kind of you know world class photographer like yourself, and then you grabbed onto the Sony, and it's you know it's you're saying it's you know it's it's the next it's the next camera you're saying right the brand well, Sony is taking is taking innovation to a new level. I think so. They've been far more innovative than anything that Nikon or Canon has been doing in the last couple of years. So. Yeah, it, it works for me. I'm pretty happy. And a lot of the photographers I know are pretty happy. You know, it's kind of a religious thing to a certain extent that people pick a camera and, you know, you're kind of stuck with it for a long time because you're buying into a whole system because you buy the lenses and everything else that goes with it. So making a change is very difficult to do. Um, but once you make that change, you kind of tend to stick with it. Back to kind of, you know, traveling the world, what what's the next place that you, you're planning on traveling once kind of things get kind of you know get the green light? I have no clue. <laughs> I have absolutely no clue when things are going to change and what's going to open. You know, everything's not going to open all at once. It's not like we're going to have one day. Yeah. Where you know, hey, we're over, we're done now. It's it's going to happen periodically, and it's going to depend on what's available and what else I got going on. So I don't know. How do you how do you decide that? Like as far as before, how would you uh, just kind of hey I'm I'm gonna decide to go to Chile or you know to Spain? I get opportunities. I get invited by travel companies and tourist boards. Uh, so it really depends what opportunities are available, and also just where I'm interested in going. Uh, if I've been there before, I'm always more tempted to go to places that I've not visited. So. That's really what it's dependent upon. But right now, nothing's happening. So I, I don't even see a point in trying to develop plans or anything. You know, when this first started back in March, I thought it would be done by like April. <laughs> like everyone, right? Everyone yeah, I thought oh, this would take a month and, you know, then, then it'll be done. It's like, no, not even close. And at this point, I don't know if anything's going to be happening next year. So I don't see the point in, in making plans for something that more likely than not, I'm going to have to cancel. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of see it going the long, the long road. I feel like twenty twenty two is gonna be the year where things actually maybe start getting normal. You know, so that's, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy, but I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, probably. Hopefully, everything gets back to normal. But I mean, in the meantime, you're you're in your own bed. But you know, when you were out and about, tell us a little bit. Tell us, uh, you know, the funniest place you ever uh, fallen asleep at. Like on on the side of a of a cliff, or you know, or maybe maybe like on you know one of those uh, tundra buggies. Oh, I don't usually fall asleep. Uh, I'm horrible when it comes to like sleeping on airplanes and and stuff like that. Uh, and I think that when you travel, you kind of learn not to fall asleep in those places because that's when you're probably going to be putting yourself in the most danger. Uh, falling asleep in some place where someone could rob you or, or something like that is probably not the best idea and falling asleep on an edge of a cliff. Also probably not a good idea. Yeah. I've been, I don't know. I've done all sorts. I've landed on nuclear aircraft carriers. I've been dog sledding in the Yukon scuba diving, you know, uh, where the great, uh, lighthouse of Alexandria was the great barrier reef. You name it. Has there been ever been a, uh, like a time where you've maybe even, even like a, a, had a bit of danger you kind of felt like hey maybe we should get out of here or something like that as far as underwater photography that really is its own thing i've done it but i've done it with professional underwater photographers who had the right equipment and usually the equipment for underwater photography to do it right costs more than the camera like to get a good 
housing unit and the lighting and everything else, not to mention the dive gear. Um, as far as, yeah, I've, I can't say I've ever been in any real danger. Probably taking photos, the biggest thing I've had to deal with was I was in Bangkok about 10 years ago and they were having some real big protests. And I was like between several hundred cops in riot gear and several thousand protesters. And I was just this dude with a camera between them. Uh, that was kind of hairy, but it worked out for the best and I got some good photos. Yeah, I mean, you kind of, you, you see the photos and you feel like, oh man, how do you get that photo? But, you know, people don't understand sometimes that, you know, these photographers and yourself, you know, you guys carry like, you know, these, these zoom lenses where you could take a, you could take a picture of a bear, you know, it seems that it's close, but I mean, I think I, I always, I always enjoy wildlife photography because it's not often where, you know, because you, you get those photos, but I mean, the closest I've been to so, something like a bear is like at a zoo, but it's, it's nothing like taking them in their natural habitat, you know? Yeah, there are some animals you just don't want to mess around with. You know, they're not going to, they, they're very dangerous. And I think one of the, the problems a lot of people have when they travel is they don't have that respect for wildlife. So you hear stories every so often in the news of people getting out of their car in Yellowstone and hugging a buffalo. <laughs> it's got to be one of the dumbest things in the world you could do. I mean, those are huge animals. You know, they weigh the amount of a small car. <laughs> if, they, if they charge you, you're screwed. There's nothing you can do. Yeah, I've seen so many videos of, you know, just, just that video of, of just people getting close. And then they, they, all of a sudden, they're shocked why, they're, why it's charging towards them. Right. <laughs> oh, man. So with with all that, you know, you're you're home, you're doing podcasts, you know that. So, you know, what's what do you got planned for the end of the year? You know, uh, you got obviously you're gonna be doing more podcasts, but uh, you got any 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 work you're releasing? Uh, you know, where can people go and find your work? They just search for my name, Gary Arndt, or just search for the word Gary and travel. <clears throat> I'll come up. I'm all over the internet. I've you know got social media accounts on everything. I'm super easy to find. My website is everything-everywhere.com or just search for everything everywhere. It'll pop up. And uh, yeah, you can you can check out all my photos. I have many tens of thousands of travel photos that are available on my website, plus stories from different places I've been. And uh, of course, my podcast, which I update every single day. Perfect. And we will be tuning into that podcast. And then, you know, we'll be kind of you know, checking in on you real soon, Gary. And thanks for just stopping by on the uh, Hardwood Rod podcast. And, you know, and look forward to, you know, seeing what else you capture. Well, thank you for having me. No problem, Gary. We'll catch you on the next one. Okay. Would you like to be on the podcast? Got something to talk about? Make sure you head over to the website, hardwoodrod.com. Leave your name and the topic you'd like to discuss, and I'll add you to the calendar. We just want our respect. Rob wants his respect. <laughs> Coach Vogel wants his respect. Our organization wants their respect. Laker Nation wants their respect. And I want my damn respect, too. <laughs>